Hello and welcome to Full Contact Nerd. I'm Chris Alvarez and thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Jonathan Jans, author of The Raven, published by Flame Tree Press, September 8th, 2020. Uh, thank you for speaking with me. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Um, so you've written, you've published ma many horror novels, so it seems like you have control of what you write. How did this particular idea, The Raven, um, kind of rise above all the other ideas you have and, and get published now? Yeah, I think that at any given time, I've got several ideas in my head, and it's kind of which one elbows the others out of the way. Mm -hmm. And so the, Ra the Raven is one that I've had in mind. This is going to sound weird, but there's a song by Blue Oyster Cult called mm -hmm. Astronomy, and I actually wasn't aware of that song until I heard this Metallica cover of that song. And so that's the, the, the version that I kind of fell in love with. Mm -hmm. And then back and I heard the other version. But anyway, that song was kind of the impetus of the Raven. And like the main character in that song is named Des Zenova. Mm -hmm. And my, my protagonist is Des. Mm -hmm. And so I I'd had it in my mind since maybe 2006, 2007. And I just, I didn't really have a plot to go with it. I just kind of had the main character in the basic situation. And eventually, I think it was a combination of that germinating long enough and eventually maybe picking up some influences from other sources like Mad Max Fury Road mm -hmm. is one of my favorite movies. It's my favorite action movie. So it absorbed a little bit of that. I, I love Steinbeck and of Mice and Men is this is this book I've taught before and I was teaching it last year and it, it, a little bit of that or a couple years ago and that kind of joined the mix and eventually all these things kind of formed together and then The Raven had to be written. So mm -hmm. I think it was like a combination of things that built up over time. So tell me, um, let's talk about the basics about the book, the protagonist, the setting, the conflict. Yeah, so the protagonist, so it's it's this post-apocalyptic novel. It's the first. It's definitely a horror novel, but it's post-apocalyptic, so it's got those sci-fi fantasy elements as well. Mm -hmm. Kind of a Western vibe, too. I, I like Westerns a lot. Uh, a little bit like The Dark Tower, uh, some of the same, I don't know, feeling that you'd get when reading. I'm not saying that I'm on par with Stephen King, of course, <laughs> but the feeling that maybe one would get while reading The Gunslinger or The Wastelands. I think is a little bit similar to the vibe of the Raven, but the, the, the post-apocalyptic story follows this guy who has no special abilities. Uh, it's two years after this terrible apocalyptic event. And essentially these geneticists and nuclear physicists, these rogue scientists, they realized that in human DNA, uh, th there is a lot of what we call junk DNA that's mm -hmm. unidentified, so it's just labeled junk. But my novel posits that those strands were actually monstrous strands that over time – so there's a reason why in every culture, no matter how far flung or isolated, you get the vampire myth or you get the cannibal myth. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because – or the shapeshifter myth. The reason why is that they were all once real, and they're still in our DNA codes – so these, uh, this virus that was created unlocks those long dormant strands and very quickly people without the monstrous strands are, they fall victim to those who have them. So now two years later, the only survivors are basically people who have these monstrous sides. My main character is a rare human who doesn't have any kind of, at least if he does, it's still latent within him. And that's what people are called without monstrous abilities. They're, they're called latents mm -hmm. in this world. So he has no monstrous abilities. He's just a normal guy trying to survive in this world of monsters. And uh, at the beginning of the book, he's trying to find this woman that he's in love with named Susan, who was taken by this flesh peddler who sells people to either cannibals or vampires obviously for their blood or their food mm -hmm. or their flesh mm -hmm. and so Dent is trying to get her back he's pursuing her across this post-apocalyptic apocalyptic wasteland mm -hmm. do you your previous novels do they sort of and i know you know i'm not saying anyone should stick to one genre but do your others also kind of mix different sort of elements like this yeah, they do uh, frequently. So I, I wrote this one for Cemetery Dance called The Dismembered, and it's kind of a historical horror novel. And uh, others kind of take like like coming of age 
and mix it with horror. And, and I like that. I like how I feel like horror is this really versatile genre that blends well with just about everything. And, and so and one cool thing about The Raven, you know, you mentioned my previous novels. Um, it takes this mythos that I've slowly been building, maybe unintentionally. <laughs> so I've written a werewolf novel. And so that that sort of um, idea, the, the way that people become werewolves, the what triggers werewolves, their, their changes, that bleeds into The Raven. I've written a vampire novel. I wrote a, a vampire western called Dust Devils. And the mythology there also kind of permeates The Raven in the vampire aspect of that novel. So you get a lot of my other books kind of bleeding into this one, which has been kind of fun hmm. um, to kind of bring everything full circle to a degree, at least at this point in my career. Do you um, either in this, in the Raven or, or your previous novels, do you ever take sort of a sympathetic view of the monsters or the monsters just bad? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it depends on the monster. In Wolfland, I yeah. So basically, people who are werewolves, most people don't want to be werewolves in that book. There are four people who get attacked in the opening scene, and three of the four really resist it. They don't want to change. They don't want to go berserker. They don't want to hurt anyone. One really embraces the change because he likes the power. He likes this feeling because he's been. He feels like he's been bullied his whole life. Um, but in Dust Devils, the vampires that I really, and this is not to throw shade at anybody else's iteration of vampires. Mm. I'm not one of those guys, you know, you have people who hate Twilight. <laughs> I've never read, I've never read Twilight. I've never watched the movies. I have nothing against Twilight, but, um, my vampires are not the, the sympathetic tortured kind. Mine are like, uh, Bill Paxton in Near Dark. Mm. I like the, for or Jerry Dandridge in Fright Night. Uh, I really like the ferocious, bloodthirsty type of vampire. So in that instance, it's not a sympathetic view at all. It's <laughs> it's really just one that that that, that revels in that bloodlust. Mm -hmm. So why did you choose a a post apocalyptic world? Is it would it just was it cooler to explore? Or like what elements of it helped for this this novel? Yeah, I think. I think it's really it goes back to that song when I when I heard that song that Metallica song the 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 lyrics were very evocative and then this landscape that I imagined was this blasted landscape um, where there were no humans. I mean, I guess that's kind of the commonality of post-apocalyptic, right? You know, usually there's a reduction in, 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 in humankind. But I think that that's really what helped world build to a degree. Obviously, I still had to put it down on paper, but it, it almost grew in my imagination, fully formed from that song. And then the, the plot kind of developed really from the world. So the setting came first. And, and the vibe came first, and then the plot really came later to kind of fit into that setting. Hmm. I just had a thought, maybe you could comment on it. You know, no, so when you have horror, you know, you have areas of, of darkness and death, you know, like graveyards or, or the, hmm. you know, the fallen down homes. But with a post-apocalyptic world, it's like the whole world is a graveyard and like you can go anywhere and... <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfectly said. I think that's exactly right. It's like, what more ripe a setting for horror could there possibly be you've got you've got isolation you've got these ter this terrible backstory right everybody every character comes preloaded with terrible memories in many cases in my story people have killed their loved ones unintentionally because they didn't know that the change was upon them they didn't know that they were about to transform and so everybody is freighted with this terrible guilt but like you said, it really is just just a delicious uh, setting for as, as sadistic and awful as that sounds. It really is a delicious <laughs> setting for horror. Right. So for the Raven, was there? Uh, it, you know, it's fantasy. It's um, comes from your imagination. But did you do any research of any kind for any elements of it? I did. I did. There's. It's. I didn't realize this until I had said it. Nobody like called me out on it. But it seems like there's there's this joke that a lot of people know everybody claims to know a, a nuclear um a rocket scientist mm -hmm. it's it's i don't know where i saw that on twitter probably <laughs> somebody said like made a joke of it that everybody knows a rocket scientist so i guess there's nothing impressive in my saying this but one of my good friends is a rocket scientist <laughs> um so i guess i'm the walking stereotype claiming to know a rocket scientist but he he has his own company he fights for he battles for these contracts with NASA 
and he's we're, we're over here. I'm in West Lafayette, Indiana, which is where Purdue is, and he's he's in this research park near Purdue. Mm -hmm. He's just this brilliant guy. And he really knows his stuff. He knows like, so I got to ask him all about like the delivery vessel. How would you spread this virus? Um, what would have to happen? How far away would the, would the missiles have to be? Where would you launch them? And so we, we kind of, with his help, I created, you know, there are these, I guess, I guess these strategic game developers. Um, it was almost like that, like where we got to design, we got to kind of orchestrate the end of the world together. Hmm. And so where would we set them up? What kinds of missiles would we need? What, e even down to what kind of vehicle would, would transport these missiles? And then what, how, what would Earth's like defense system be against these? And how could we overcome that? How could we achieve this total destruction and, and spread this completely and so my friend his name is bj but bj was the one who really and so if anything is right in the science it was his doing and whatever is wrong is my fault <laughs> um and then also is I, i'm an english teacher and so i asked a lot of the science teachers in my school who are very bright much brighter than i am i asked them about the biology of this and they were able to fill in the chemistry that stuff and they were able to be the experts there so again anything wrong is my fault but i did do probably more research for this book than any other um mm -hmm. usually when it comes to horror a lot of the research i do is i talk to a lot of cops because you get into like weaponry and stuff and what kind of gun this guy would have mm -hmm. but with this type of book it was more about the science of it and and i didn't want to I didn't want to be the kind of writer because sometimes you see writers and this again, not throwing shade at anybody, but I, I didn't want it to like to wear the research on my sleeve because my main character is an English teacher. Yeah. And so he he wouldn't know everything. Right. He mm. wouldn't know the, the deep, the nitty gritty of DNA. He he would know what he's been told. So I feel like it's organically, naturally uh, scattered throughout the book. But yeah, I had a lot of good help. I'm speaking with Jonathan Jans, author of The Raven. You can find more information about his work at jonathanjans.com. If you like this podcast, Full Contact Nerd, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. Please sign up for my weekly newsletter at fullcontactnerd.com or chrisalvarez.com to keep up with my latest posts. You'll also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at militaryhistorypodcast.com and technologyinspace.com. Now back to the podcast. So are you more of a, or in The Raven and, and your other novels, is it, is the, are the creatures more like creatures, children of science, or how much magic do you blend in? And I don't want you to spoil that, anything. Sure. No, that's really interesting. I think it's – I try to make it science-based, but then again, things start to happen so rapidly because if you think about the, the concept here, and this is not meant to be self-aggrandizement or self-congratulatory, which means it's probably going to sound that way, <laughs> but, but – but, but the world is really almost limitless, right? Mm -hmm. if, if there are all these monsters and if you start to go and run with the notion that, that most legends have a basis in reality and you think of all the mythology that you have in the world, obviously I want to be respectful. I don't want to start to appropriate from – marginalized groups and stuff like that i don't, I don't want to be disrespectful and just willy-nilly start throwing everything in mm -hmm. but at the same time there's a lot there there in in in, in human history there's an awful lot of mythology mm -hmm. and so it, there's a big battle scene at the end of the book where you start to get introduced several different creatures and so i do think it does take on this kind of mythic magical aspect and then i think it's my job to try to balance that with whatever scientific elements i have established mm -hmm. so it doesn't seem just ridiculous and random but at the same time i do try to push the boundaries of what could be in this world and also i want it to be a series so i want to kind of hint and foreshadow some of the stuff that could come about later on without absolutely spoiling it hmm. So what are some of the um, the things in media that inspire your work? And that could include books, music, shows, games, anything. Yeah, I tell you, a lot of inspiration for me over the past year. I've met a couple people or become good friends with a couple people. 
And in, in obviously it's not limited to just these two people, but, but when you talk about inspiration, I'm reminded of these two people. Mm -hmm. So Josh Mallerman is the author of Bird Box mm -hmm. and, he, and, and much more than that. But he has become a good friend and he will c just constantly just, – just, just being in orbit with him is fun because he is like the supernova of creative energy. And every time we talk, I get further ideas or I get ideas for whatever work I'm on. His manager is, is my manager, and, and that's a guy named Ryan Lewis. And he was an executive producer on Bird Box. And Ryan is really, in his own way, he's just as creative, differently than Josh, but also extremely creative. And so Ryan and I will, like Ryan will point me to different types of media, He'll, he'll type he'll, like for example he he recommended Lovecraft Country the other day which I mean to I meant to watch anyway but then or or we'll start to talk about something that we both watched like we started we, we both like Cobra Kai mm -hmm. uh, which you know, I know some people think is cheesy or whatever but it's got a lot to recommend that there's a lot there are a lot of cool elements in it mm -hmm. and then as we start to talk about that that invariably influences my and this is going to sound so cheesy like I'm one of those affected artists <laughs> but I, I feel like any artist like it's your it's your instrument uh, David Harbour the, the actor Chief Hopper in Stranger Things is the one from whom I got that I'm sure it's not a new thing but he talks about owning your instrument and in, and in, in being aware of your own instrument and and I feel like I've become more aware of my myself and my 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 artistic consciousness as an instrument and so I'm a little more strategic now about how I inform that and what I let influence that and, and sometimes you even strategically invite that and you try to imbibe that and let it permeate your instrument and so Ryan is constantly pointing me in new directions by by mentioning media or talking about things that he finds interesting Josh does that constantly just with our interactions I, I I'm constantly reading I'm constantly watching movies and, and, and new series so I, I really feel like it's it's this positive cross-pollination that happens and and again I become more street strategic about it. I don't just watch anything hmm. I don't want to watch crap and I don't want to read crap I want to watch and read good things hmm. and, and and find influence and inspiration in other things. But I, I guess maybe part of it's luck because I've had, but I think a lot of it's knowing whom to trust, right? Because you're not just going to listen to anybody. So I think that when you find some people that you trust, make your recommendations, then you can kind of open the floodgates a little wider and open your, your lens a little wider and, and then try to allow that, that to shine in on you and, and inform you. So mm -hmm. it's been a really cool year creatively because of that. Now, some of the, the, most popular classic horror movies are really cheesy, you know, which some people might say are, <laughs> are crap, but, uh, <laughs> it's true. No, you're right. It, it is cheesy. And I, I think cheesy, you know, there are different types of cheese and all that stuff. I, and there's good cheesy and bad cheesy. And I don't know. It probably depends on what you do with it. Right. And how, how it can, how it can help you and how, how what, what you can take from it and what you can leave. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any of the classics, either books, movies, or anything that, uh, that you liked? like when you were growing up? Yeah, I, I mentioned Fright Night earlier. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize just how much that influenced me, but it really did. It influenced me a lot, and I'm very grateful for that now. I think I was influenced by like John Carpenter, Halloween, and The Thing. Mm -hmm. I was influenced by The Exorcist. Here's the thing about the 70s and 80s, and it's funny. Like Somebody could look at my work and maybe – be, be critical of it in this way but it's something that I own and it's something of which I'm aware mm -hmm. it's like you look at those those movies and books from that era and there's this earnestness about them mm -hmm. like I, I watched the Karate Kid last night for the first time since it came out mm -hmm. because my kids and I just watched Cobra Kai they'd never seen Karate Kid and there's this earnestness in Karate Kid this 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 I don't know it's kind of like this this wonderful naivety mm -hmm. and there's this line where Ralph Macchio, Danny LaRusso, says to uh, Mr. Miyagi, he says, you're the best friend I ever, I've ever had. And it's right after Mr. Mi Mr. Miyagi gives him this car. And, you know, you could look at that cynically and say, oh, it's so cheesy. That's such crap. But I look at it and, and maybe I'm just this, this stupid, naive guy or whatever. But I was really moved. Like I was choked up at that moment knowing that it's maybe a little bit cheesy or corny or whatever, but I still think it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that earnestness really is part of 
what informs my work. Um, I'm not afraid to to be like that in my work. I'm not afraid. I mean, it's not like I intentionally set out to be cheesy or anything like that. But I'd rather have real emotion and and an earnest emotion than try to be too cool for school, mm -hmm. which I feel like sometimes modern art strives for. It's like you try so hard to be ironic, you try so hard to be aloof that you end up being a little bit hollow mm -hmm. and soulless. And I'd much rather have a soul and be accused of cheesiness than 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 be too cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to mention on Karate Kid, I I think when a movie has a bunch of sequels, people start to think it's a cheesy series. But I think the first one, at least, was a pretty well-made film. You know, it had a lot of strong points. So, I agree, and I think the cheese in that movie, it's mostly with like these. It's because of the music, and it's this. <laughs> You know the, the the montages of 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 dating or the montages of some of that stuff. Sure, it's a little dated, but like you're talking about, they say about a good car, it's got it where it counts. Mm -hmm. That movie's got it where it counts, man. Mm -hmm. That that central relationship between Miyagi and Danny, that's beautiful. No matter mm -hmm. what era, no matter what genre, that's a beautiful friendship, and it's and it's pretty interesting and and relatively unique. Yeah. And and so I think that's that's why the film still resonates and packs a punch, and that's the worst unintentional pun of all time i promise i didn't do that but there you go <laughs> you're forgiven i guess if if if, <laughs> if, if for, or if forgiveness is required <laughs> ah, thanks man <laughs> um so if this if the raven had um had a soundtrack of any kind what what would you say it would be nice dude that was really good um <laughs> i i think that junkie xl Tom Holkenberg, I think is his name or something like that. He's the guy who did the Mad Max score, mm -hmm. which that was criminally, uh, it missed out on an Oscar nomination. The, the movie got like 10 Oscar nominations. Somehow the score did not get nominated. Mm -hmm. I don't know what alternate universe that happened in because that's one of the best scores I've ever heard. I think he'd score it. Um, but maybe with, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, Ennio Morricone. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be disrespectful because I've never said that name out loud. But mm -hmm. the guy who did The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and I think he also did like Hateful Eight mm -hmm. for Tarantino. Yep. But that... So it's maybe I think he actually did the thing with Carpenter too, maybe. Hmm. But um, it's a combination of that Western vibe, that spaghetti Western vibe, with the Junkie XL driving synthesizer heavy, in your face kind of Mad Max. Mm -hmm. Maybe a combination of those two, I think, would 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 make the Raven. In fact, if you took this, you know, those types of music and put them together, that's the vibe of the novel, or at least that's what I was striving for. Hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, I was reading a. a few the first pages of the raven i like the style a lot i like how you write and it, thank you it it kind of made me think of uh of video games too and i'm wondering if do you do you sort of write imagining like uh like it's a show in any way like are you almost maybe subconsciously writing to tv or, or shows that that sort of way if that makes sense yeah no i think it does and i i really it's I don't want to sound – you never know. I, I, I'm just being honest here. I don't want to sound like I'm a, an affected artist or whatever like that. But I really I, – I, I am – I become – it's it's all like actors talk about and actresses talk about. Like they – in method acting, they become the role, right? They are they're, – they're living in that skin. And I try to do the same thing in my writing. Mm -hmm. If I am – if I'm Des, the main character here, I am – I'm I'm in inhaling that that fresh cold morning air and and feeling that that arm cinch under my throat as he gets taken <laughs> wears. Um, I'm seeing what he's seeing. I'm feeling the the I'm smelling the halitosis of his captor <laughs> as he grabs me. Um, I try to in every possible way be that character, and in in that way I I hope it's like this. I know that that's not exactly what a movie is like because a movie is you've got not only the protagonist's point of view in the insert shot, but then you you see his face as well. But I do try to make it a combination of almost like a cinematic experience and like this, like a first person shooter, right? Where you're seeing through the character's eyes. You mentioned video games there earlier. Mm -hmm. So I try to make it as immersive as, as humanly possible while still keeping it as cinematic as possible. What do you think, what makes horror? Is it like sort of the physical, the sensory elements, the, you know, it's, 
it's an open question. It's something I always wonder about. Yeah, I, I think what, to me, what makes horror is it's all about, and, and it's interesting, that the, and this is why I have such a wide definition. My definition, it would make other horror writers and fans, and even non-horror writers and fans, it'd make them scoff or roll their eyes or whatever. So I'm not saying I'm right, but the way I approach it is this very vast, this very vast territory. In fact, I think it's almost limitless. And, and essentially, it is in an environment where there is no floor and there is no ceiling. Hmm. And, and, and that means that the, the depths of human depravity are, are, are depth, de, uh, depthless. Hmm. Um, there, you know, because in horror, humankind, one book that I, I, think, I think of as a horror novel is The Road by Cormac McCarthy, mm-hmm. and by extension, the movie with Viggo Mortensen, which I haven't seen. I think it's directed by John Hillcoat, and I love everybody involved in that. I mean, at least as artists, I need to see it. Yeah. But in in The Road, there are scenes, it's one of my favorite books, there's a scene where, not to be awful here, but there's a, there's this baby on a on a spit that the, these people are roasting. And, and like, that's one of the most horrific images that's just, just emblazoned on my me- mental retinas forever, indelibly. Mm-hmm. And that's horror. That's true horror. Like, you can't think, uh, you can scarcely conceive of something more horrific than that. Mm-hmm. And I think moments like that make of that story a horror story. Yes, it's other things, too, but it's also a horror story. And then also, I think, in, in that story, though, the, the father's love for his son is transcendent. And so there is no ceiling on humankind's nobility. And, and that's the glory of horror. That's what I love about horror. So I think a horror, not, a horror story is any story in which you start to feel that bottom dropping out beneath you. But you also, because of that, um, the contrast is, is you start to see people, as well as doing terrible things, people doing incredibly loving things as well. And that's what draws me to it. I love the limitlessness of it in both respects. Um, and that's why I consider a lot of stories horror stories that, that other people wouldn't. Hmm. So oh, that anticipates the question I was going to ask next, um, which is, is there any work, again, book, movie, show, that people don't necessarily consider horror that you say, wow, this, this actually is horror or it feels yeah. like horror to me. That's a great question. Let, let me give you the quintessential example that again, nobody but me w- would see as horror. <laughs> There's a play and I love plays because I love how they, the currency of theater is dialogue. And, and I feel like that's one of the best ways to improve one's dialogue is through reading theater. But there's a play by Harold Pinter uh, who's just an amazing playwright, and it's called The Homecoming. And um, in that play, this guy um, brings, it's, it's this guy with, I think he's the youngest brother, and there's a father, and then he has brothers. And I forget what happened to the mom. I read it back in college, but I just remember it was an eye-opening experience because it, it really opened up these vistas of darkness. He brings his new bride home, and I think it's his father who says, well, let's let's try her out. And, and he starts kissing her and she consensually kisses him back. The new bride starts making out with the father. And that situation was just so shocking to me and horrifying to me. Hmm. And I, it was one of the most horrific scenes I'd ever read. And I started to realize because my conception of horror before that was maybe a little bit limited to, to like the visceral, to, to werewolves and vampires and ghosts. And I started to realize how emotional and how, how emotionally violent horror could be because that was a betrayal of this young man, both by his, by his wife and by his father, both of whom taking this vulnerability and this trust that he had in both of them and betraying it before his eyes and doing it so cavalierly and nonchalantly. Um, to me, the, the homecoming is one of the most horrifying things I've ever read. And, and some of the most frightening things I've ever read, you know, feature moments of emotional peril like that um, in works that nobody would ever see as horror. But to me, that's scary. To me, that's because I think we all do have this fear of betrayal deep down. We have this, this, these insecurities, these – and I, again, I know my wife would never do that, but you know, I still – we we all have that that feeling. We, we most of us, because how many of us in life have not been betrayed by a friend? How many of us in life have not found a, a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever cheating at some point? That happened to me when I was a senior in high school. Um, and, and man, that stung. That hurt. 
because I'd felt like I'd opened up to this young woman and then she was a year older than me. And then I find out she's cheating on me and man, you know, I think that's, that's horrific, mm. not making up myself a victim, but I'm just saying that that's a pretty universal experience that, that, that we've all felt in some way. Mm. And I feel like that's, that's as horrific as, as an ax murderer, really. So physical death or uh, uh, spiritual, spiritual death could be as horrific as, as a physical death then it sounds oh, like a hundred percent yes and, and that's why that's why i think in in uh salem's lot um there's this notion you talk about spirituality there i mean it, it, there are a lot of ways to take that adjective spiritual <laughs> but in uh father callahan is is this fallen priest in C stephen king's salem's lot he wrote that that was like a second novel at least second published novel it remains one of his most popular it's probably my favorite stephen king novel and i and i love stephen king's novels all the way through today but i think that's one of the reasons why it's so resonant is because of moments like that uh, father callahan it's it's not just a physical danger it's a spiritual danger to him because these things that he's believed are 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 either are either failing him or he's failing them and so I think when you get into the, the, the metaphysical realm, you go into the, yeah, another layer of horror. And, and, and I think that's, again, that's not just limited to traditional horror novels. You can find that kind of spiritual horror in other realms, too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm speaking with Jonathan Jans, author of The Raven. You can find more information about his work at jonathanjans.com. If you like this podcast, Full Contact Nerd, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. Please sign up for my weekly newsletter at fullcontactnerd.com or chrisalvarez.com to keep up with my latest posts. You'll also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at militaryhistorypodcast.com and technologyinspace.com. Now back to the podcast. So is there anything, so as far as your writing process, is there anything you do that you think is out of the ordinary as far as uh, completing drafts or your final piece? I think that one place where I'd, I'm a much better editor than I am a writer. Uh, you've heard people say that before. They're better rewriters than they are writers. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm definitely in that realm. I'm definitely in that group. I think that one thing that I'm very neurotic and, and very um, it's 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 become a problem because <laughs> I, I write relatively quickly. I write in a white heat. I think Bradbury might have said that, but I really do. But then I just get so exacting and just painstaking and almost self-torturing in the editing process. I, it's something for which I probably kind of, and I'm not saying this lightly, I kind of need help. <laughs> I, need, I need to really, I really need to, to take stock of myself because with every successive book, my standards for my own work become higher. Hmm. But, but, but yet really in first drafts, my first drafts aren't that much better than they were a few years ago. So it's like my, my, <laughs> my expectations for, for my, myself have elevated and my, my process has become more meticulous. But still, I'm, I, these rough drafts are very rough. And, and so I, I think that I, I, I edit longer and I edit for, for just more time than I think most authors do. And that's not a pat on the back to myself. That's more of a – that might be a cry for help. <laughs> I need to streamline it. I need to figure out a, a way to do this that's not so torturous. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question at all, but I can, I can tell you that that's, I don't think I'm like most authors in that regard. I think there are other authors, of course, that are meticulous. I don't know that most authors are as just self-torturing as I am when it comes to the editing process. Mm, I see a horror story there. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> right there, right? Maybe that's the next project. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... So when you say it takes a while, though, does that mean you, you'll stop and think about it like long stretches of time or you just sit there staring and, and rewriting, like literally physically attacking it for for extended periods? 
both of those both of those the, in, in the editing process it just i'm haunted the only time that i'm truly free is during the rough draft writing and at that point it's just it's really fun like i i'm a teacher so i i do a lot of rough draft writing in the summer mm. i write some rough draft during the school year but it's hard especially this year with the pandemic and trying to teach during that i've never been this busy in my life but during the summers, that's just, that's the fun part, man. Then you just go, you're just writing, you're feeling free. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when it comes to the editing process, I'm like haunted. I'm like carrying this around with me all the time. I was just, re I was watching the Deathly Hallows with my youngest um, uh, part two. And there's a scene where Harry is carrying this goblin on his back underneath the invisibility cloak and that goblin on my back is like my work in progress at all times um constantly breathing in my ear constantly whispering to me and it's just a it's it's difficult i, I don't, i'm not like trying to get whatever sympathy here but but it, it, in every way yeah like it's on my mind all the time i edit before bed I, I write notes about it on my phone throughout the day. I'll have a thought while I'm teaching and I have to, between classes, jot it down. So I'm constantly living with it. I'm constantly trying to improve my books. And then, yeah, I'm, and when I get a chance, then I'm working on the book. I, I'm trying to apply these changes and make it better. So really is like this, this, this forever haunting that takes place with a work in progress for me. What part do you think you edit the most? Like plot, word choices, dialogue? Yeah, the generic answer that you don't deserve because you deserve a better answer. So I'll give you a better answer. The generic <laughs> answer is all the above because it really is all the above. But I think most of all, it's character. Hmm. Most of all, it's characterization. It's like you you get to know these characters better and better as you write. And it's like all these things are tied together. It's like dialogue. I think it all like if if it's a wheel. Um, everything, you know, they're all spokes leading back to the hub, which is character. So dialogue is character, theme is character, um, setting is It all informs character and it all shapes character. So that's what I go back to. And word choice also. In, in, in the current book I'm, I'm editing, Halloween Gods, there are five teenagers and, and it's alternating points of view for, with all five. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm going through the editing process, the delineation is getting more and more pronounced and I'm getting to know these characters better and better. And so you begin to get to the soul of these characters and, and then what is this character's deepest fear, most powerful desire? Um, most overwhelming insecurity, greatest goal, um, and then you know how is this? And then how is this character? Because we all have different selves, you know. Of course, you've heard of the social mask, and so we wear social masks in different settings. And then how does this social mask alter when when he's around this person versus this person? So there there are these different versions of the character that start to that start to um, clarify, crystallize in different scenes and so the care because we do that like i'm different with you than i am with my wife than i am with my first child than i am with my second child and third child mm -hmm. than i am with my students so as you edit and you form the character it starts to and i think it becomes as three-dimensional as humanly possible um but that's in, in really in that way that's i think one of the reasons why this is so difficult for me because you really there's never a stopping point. You can never stop because people are incredibly complex. And so too should your characters be. And just when you think you're done, you realize, you know what? Hmm. This character would be thinking differently in this scene than you had her thinking. And, and you didn't add that element to her. And she'd feel this way. And, and that would come out in her interior monologue. Um, and so you really need to go back and, and just it, uh, massage that scene a little bit to express this facet that you didn't before. So it sounds like you're turning, and I'm not saying this is a, is a joke or something, but like each character becomes as many more characters as there are other characters they're dealing with. You know, it's like I, I see this huge kaleidoscope of of views. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and I think that's the the I think you articulated it better than I did, but I think that's that's the the goal is for for those characters to be as complex as we are. Because we are yeah, we all have basic needs and all that stuff. But I think that when you start to when you when you pull back and start to look at each one of us and, and our behaviors and how they vary and our thoughts, I think you start to really see 
that the human animal is, 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 it does take a lot. And I don't think we ever fully become even self-aware, you know, much less completely understand others. Um, I think we can still surprise ourselves and surprise others. And that's one of the cool parts. That's one of the most enjoyable parts of, of editing. Um, because you, you, you're continually discovering new vistas it, within these characters in, in those, in that kaleidoscope, you know, it's forever expanding as you, as you twist, um, as you see it through new, you know, in new ways, as new shafts of light, you start to see different facets revealed. So I'm, I'm assuming you're not doing it just to do it, that each of these views um, serves some part of the story um, in some way. Is right. That, and so, so it seems like, and that's, that's an even additional angle in which each of these changes and, and sharpenings of character that you make need to also connect to your overall plot and, and sort of theme, I guess. No, absolutely. A hundred percent. And that's opening up yet another area of constant metamorphosis because as the characters change, invariably, if you're true to the story, certain plot points and elements or at the very least on a scene level are going to change and then maybe even larger plot elements are going to change as the characters change um so you're right and i think that's what makes this this constantly shifting and and, and difficult to master process because if you are allowing your characters to be in charge that means that they're also in charge of the larger work and you're really not um because I, I think i think readers this is going to sound i'll just use a cheesy like analogy here but linus in the great pumpkin we talks about the most sincere pumpkin patch um and i think that readers sense a lack of sincerity i think they sense when the author is making the characters serve the plot uh, and making characters behave as they would not behave. I think that's when you really begin to lose a lot of readers because they're like, no, 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 no. I know that character. She wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. She would act that way just because you need this to happen because you need to wrap this thing up. That that's not true. That doesn't ring true. Um, and I think that readers are readers are sharp and readers pick up on that la lack of sincerity. So I think that if you don't have those hardwired together, if you don't have those constantly connected and, and morphing together, I think it's going to do the book a disservice and your readers are going to rebel. How do you map all this? Is it just mentally or do you write notes or... Yeah, it's, I, I do make myself notes. I tell you what, here's the thing. The more, so one thing I teach in my, in my high school is film literature. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, 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 the more I've taught, the more I've learned about film. I thought I knew film years ago. I didn't know anything about it. Okay. So mm -hmm. I've learned along with the students and I still have so much to learn. Um, but one thing that I've become increasingly fascinated by is film editing. And film editors, the more I study them, the more the, the thing I hear again and again, the, the common theme, if you want to find something that, that ties most editors together, they say, yeah, maybe not this phrase, but it's some version of this. They say they cut with their gut. Um, and so it's this kind of intuitive, instinctive process where their instincts guide them. And it's, that's why it's so hard to learn because it's so hard to teach because it's such a personal process that, that you, you don't really know it unless you do it. And the more you do it, the more it logical it becomes. And so I, I feel like that's what editing a novel becomes. I kind of cut with my gut. Um, and, and that's something that's very difficult to verbalize. Right. Um, but it's just like, so I, I need to end the scene here rather than here because it feels right. This feels like a more natural breaking off point just as an editor in a, a specific shot cuts on this frame rather than that frame because the, the the musical aspect of the scene the rhythm of that shot dictates that this is the frame on which to cut um and so i think that the, the more i've watched film editing and listened to film editors describe their craft 
I think the more illuminated I've become about my own approach. Yeah, I sit here and complain and all this stuff about it, but there is joy in it too, and there, there, it is fun to do too. I, I, I love doing it. It's just I get angry at myself because I, I don't see an end in sight. Like the more I do, the more I see that there still is to do, and that's aggravating. But, but I really do love it, and, and I really have become more, I think, confident as an editor just because I've trusted my gut a little bit more. It seems that um, you can do something like that if you know the material that you're working with so well to the point where yeah. you can see what's out of place, even slightly. I think that's right, and I think the more you do that, the more intimate you become with the material, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so the deeper dive you take, the, the deeper your intimacy with his work is. So you've, we've kind of, maybe we've already discussed this then. I was going to ask, how has your um, writing changed over time, your approach to writing? It sounds like it's this editing process, but maybe it's something else. Yeah, no, I, I think that the, the, in both cases they have – sorry about my dogs, by the way, no upstairs. <laughs> um, they uh, – yeah, they're very sweet and, and harmless, but they sound ferocious. <laughs> I, I think that there's just – okay, so I will always be – insecure it's just part of the way i'm wired um i i second guess myself a lot and so i think that there, we, there comes a point in our lives when we need to just be self-aware and own ourselves and know what our weaknesses are and then just do our best with those weaknesses and and to be aware of them so i'm self-conscious and i always have been um but i do think knowing that and owning that has also in a weird way made me more confident i don't know it's like it's like, okay, so we talked about the Karate Kid earlier. Danny goes out there in that final fight against Johnny Lawrence and the Karate Kid. Mm -hmm. He knows his weakness is his knee. He knows that's been, you know, he swept the leg or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to fight with that weakness, and he learns over the course of that final three or four minutes to move on that injured leg. And so if my injured leg is my insecurity, I think I've found ways to either compensate for that or ways to just look beyond that. And now when I start a book, I can, I, you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know I'm insecure. I know I'm afraid this book is going to suck. But you know what? I don't care. I'm going to go do it anyway. And, and I can just go, I can, I can blow past that, that insecurity and, and do my job and enjoy my job. And I think the same thing goes with editing. And, you know, honestly, the same thing goes with being a husband and a father and being a teacher mm -hmm. in all areas of my life. I still second guess myself. I know I'm going to second guess myself, but that doesn't mean I can't still enjoy it and still just enjoy the ride and do my best at it um, and overcome that injured leg. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in, in a way, I think that I've really become more at home in my own skin. Um, over time. And I think that's just come with practice, man. I think that's just, I think we get better the more we practice something. Hopefully, the better we get about it, uh, we get with it. And that's, that's where I am as a writer. So you teach English. Have you ever done, have, have you done other work that's influenced how or what you write? Yeah. I mean, I, so my, I teach English and creative writing and advanced creative writing in film lit. And mm -hmm. I tell you what, man, it's, I'm hard pressed to find four classes that are better suited to that, that cross pollination with writing. Cause as I'm teaching, I'm, 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 I'm in that world of world, words. I'm, I'm immersed in there. I'm a wash in words. And I apply everything I do as a teacher to my books and vice versa. So that's really, really, I think a gratifying experience. I mentioned, you know, just a moment ago, being a husband and a father and those things mm -hmm. spill into the, the writing world as far as professions are concerned. Yeah, I, back in, in the day, I was, uh, I was a, 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 a grave digger for mm -hmm. a summer. Oh, wow. um, so and yeah, so that I did that because I knew I wanted to write horror. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I, I have graveyards. You mentioned graveyards, at least some allusion to a graveyard in at least every other book I write. And I'm not saying that they're about graveyards, but you tend to, to mention them in, in the horror realm. And so that comes up again and again. And then, you know, I've been I, I coached a lot. So I I've I've. I mentioned basketball or baseball from time to time. So you see that the Chicago Cubs arise because my, my son and I are Cubs fans and I, I coached a lot of baseball. So you see that come up again and again in my writing. And I think that's just, that's a, that's a pretty natural process and add some seasoning 
And I try not to be so much on the nose that, that, that people who hate baseball would hate my books. <laughs> but, but I think it's like one of those little Easter eggs that if you are a fan of baseball, mm-hmm. there's just this little there, – there's a half paragraph there that, to which you can relate, right? <laughs> um, and so that, that's kind of fun, I think, to include. It's just uh, – sorry to be cheesy, but it's part of the instrument hey, that, that, hey. that comes out. Yeah, yeah. So with the, um, the Raven – so obviously you edited a lot, but were there many parts that you just had to take out entirely? Like, did you write more than you needed and edit it down or? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you, if you, I don't know if you ask everybody that, or if you just were, were led to that through what I've said, No, that's. but, but, but <laughs> that's a great question for me because I write way long hmm. and I cut way down, man. Uh, Stephen King said in on writing, I think he said final draft, is rough draft minus 10%. For me, final draft is rough draft minus anywhere between 20 and 70%. Wow. So I write, yeah, they're like the Dark Game was a 2019 release. I wrote 180,000 words, mm-hmm. and that book ended up being 94,000 words. Um, so I write way long, man. That's just one example, but I write so long. And then I cut it way down. Um, I think the least I've ever cut is 20, 25 percent. Um, the Raven, I probably cut about 30 percent of what I had written, 30 or 35. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot longer than what, you know, what's there now. Really, for me, it's pretty spare. Um, it's pretty short for me. And I think it's like 84,000 words. Mm-hmm. For a normal human being, that would be like normal novel length. Mm-hmm. And I know this is dictated by genre like fantasy writers tend to write longer books Mm -hmm. generally speaking um and then other genres tend to write a little shorter i think horror i don't know what the average is i'm going to guess the average horror novel is what 85 or 90 95 Um, but but um you know this one's on the shorter end for me so i cut quite a bit and that's because i wanted it to feel a little bit like stephen king's the gunslinger in, in, in that whole series, The Dark Tower, the gunslinger is notable for being pretty slim. And I wanted it to be a slim book for that reason. I want it to be pretty muscular and lean. And I think I think it ended up being that, but only after cutting it quite a bit. What, so you mentioned sort of the white heat manner in which you write your first draft. How, how much time does that cover, like usually when you write these? So if it's during the summer, I can write, I write basically a novel and a half every summer. So it, d- it depends on where I am in the previous work. Let's just say that the the, cl- the slate has been wiped, wiped clean and I get to start a new book on June the 1st. I will write that book uh, starting on June 1st and I'll finish it in mid-July. Hmm. Um, and, and if I were a full-time writer, that's probably pretty much how it would look most of the time. I write every day for almost every day and I write at least 3,000 words a day, sometimes 4,000 words a day and um, and I just write just constantly. Uh, it'll, it'll be, I'll get up in the morning and start at about like 8.15 and I'll write all the way through, sometimes I'll write all the way through past noon, um, but at least like 8.30 to, to 11.30. So I'll write at least three hours, sometimes four hours a day. And, and yeah, and so I'm just going and it's like almost like this trance like state and it's just a blast. And it's, it's, it's so immersive too, that I'll, I remind, I, what I, re, I kind of think of is Han Solo in Return of the Jedi. He has that carbon sickness cause he's been in, in carbon freeze mm-hmm. since the end of uh, Empire Strikes Back mm-hmm. and he's, he's blind and he's foggy and he can barely move and he's kind of twitching that's how i feel after i write i'll come upstairs and i just need some re-entry time into the world and i can't really form a coherent thought i'll be there in body with my kids and my wife but they'll just kind of know that i'm going to be this kind of zombified moron for a little while (laughs) with this with this you know muzzy (laughs) feeling and my tongue is going to be just fat and unable to form coherent words so yeah, so I really get into it, and then finally by like at twelve thirty or one, I'm myself again. Yeah. Well, let me ask a whimsical question. All right. When you were young, was there any power technology or fictional setting you yearned for or to be a part of? When I was young, yeah, you know, I, I think that one place 
Well, okay. So, yeah, I was a big Star Wars guy when I was young. Hmm. So every setting there, um, I was longing to experience. One that I thought of as you said that was in The Never Ending Story. Huh, yeah. um, it was that Fantasia, I guess? Uh, that was a really influential movie. I never read the book. I have the book. I've never read it. Mm-hmm. But the movie... Um, was really this kind of transportive thing for me, and it, it had it all. I consider that a horror story. Nobody else would, but the Gamork and the idea of the nothing, you know, that wolf-like creature, and then the nothing, how it eats away at the world. Um, I feel like those things were really influential on me. And obviously that was part of the world I, I wouldn't necessarily want to experience, but it was very, I think, seductive to me because I liked that scary uh, – I, I found that interesting. And then and then the way that the, the Atreyu takes on the Gamork, obviously if people haven't seen the movie or read the book, they have no frame of reference. Yeah. But I think a lot of people have probably seen the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the way that I, I, I wanted to find that courage to take on evil. So that was really, I think, the siren song of that world really called to me. Yeah. Yeah, that book uh, or that movie was, when I saw it, it was kind of disturbing to yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Um, yeah, I, kept, I liked it, but yeah, it freaked me out too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the whole thing, what, what part freaked you out? Was it the bit with the horse? With uh, What was it? I, I think that Arctic? wolf. Well, yeah, the deaths and the wolf. Yeah. yeah, I haven't seen it in a while, but those images kind of are in my mind in the back there i'm telling you that wolf is scary yeah like the the look of the wolf the the in the inexorable nature of the wolf the single-minded evil and violence of the wolf it just lives to serve this evil power and it just wants to kill mm-hmm. and, and and the way that we see it in the darkness uh the way it attack i mean every aspect of that that's a well for me i know again maybe i sound simple here but i think it's a well drawn and effective uh, villain I- i've always loved the gamork i also feel like there was something unsettling about the two worlds you know like where where the kid could affect another world and mm-hmm. be affected but if i'm remembering it correctly it, it kind of felt yeah. weird that you know, like there were these uh, ripples of, of effect. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. No, but that's brilliant. That's exactly right. And I think you're bringing us kind of to, I don't know, this coalescence of a lot of the stuff we've said or bringing us full circle. But there's this this scene early in The NeverEnding Story where this weasened book dealer says to the little boy, Bastion, says to him, your books are safe. This book isn't safe, right? When when you get done with Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, you get to be a little boy again. And then Bastion says, "Well, this book is different." And he says, "Ah, don't worry about it, kid. This book isn't for you." And of course, the implication is, is this book isn't safe. And he starts to realize that it isn't he, when he's up in that attic, and 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 the the windows spring open, and and then this breath of 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 wind and thunder and lightning start to permeate the attic. Mm-hmm. Um, he, those worlds start to collide and. Like you said, there's a ripple that connects them or that, that, that unifies them. And there's this idea that, that in Stephen King says in, in The Dark Tower, there go then, there are other worlds than these. And I think that's what's so del- just just joyous and, and beautiful about not just horror, but, but, but fiction and film and, and in books. We start to realize and we start to understand that there's this, there are these greater possibilities, and right, and, and, and our world is not finite. And then in, in, in the never ending story, it's like this gateway is opened. And I think that, that part of us were, were intimidated by that, but I think we're also very attracted to that mm-hmm. because it opens up so many possibilities. It opens up new places to explore, it, oper- it, it shows us opportunities for redemption that maybe weren't there before. You know, do we get into the afterlife and all this other? Um, so I think that this idea that it's not safe, I think we almost, I, I think that as a writer, I want to create that feeling in readers that this, this book isn't safe. Mm-hmm. I want them to start to see these other possibilities. And again, not saying I accomplish that, but I think that, that that's what many artists are trying to, that's at the heart of what they're trying to do is to make the reader feel like bastion felt and by by connection by extension how we felt during the never-ending story hmm. 
did you have any difficulties getting the book published? I know you've published a lot already. Was there any issues with that? Yeah, not really. Um, I uh, worked with Flame Tree Press on this one. Don Doria uh, <laughs> is my editor there. And he he's somebody who really has been a champion of my work and somebody with whom I get along well and somebody I trust. Mm -hmm. And so this seemed like a good book for, for Flame Tree and, and they felt mutually about that. And so it was really you know, in any in any process there's that there's that back and forth and he had suggestions and then the other the line editors they had suggestions. But yeah, there were no real hitches or difficulties with that part of the process. Um, so I, I'd say that that probably the smoothest part <laughs> of the whole thing from conception to actually having it in the hands of readers, that was probably the smoothest part. So when you're given a deadline considering, you know, your editing um, energy um, does that help? Does the, do the deadlines help, you know, give you a finish line for that or how, what happens? Yeah, they, they can help sometimes. They can also create a lot of stress. Hmm. Um, I would say maybe 40% helpful, 60% stressful. If I'm being totally honest, hmm. it, it does give you an urgency and it does help you prioritize your projects. Like I have a short story due December 31st this year, and it's one that I really am planning on getting done. It's for an anthology that I'm really excited about. So it helps prioritize things, but at the same time, it really does give you a lot of stress. You're like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to get this done? There's no way this is too Herculean a task. There's just, there are not enough hours in the day. So I, I feel a lot of stress with deadlines, even though in some ways, I guess they can be helpful. So you mentioned two projects you're working on the, the one book with the five characters and points of, you know, different points of view and the short story. Do you have other stuff that you're yeah, working? I, that's that. Yeah, I do. I have four, really four projects going right now. I have, a, I have the Halloween, I have Halloween gods, which is the novel, the work in progress. My self-imposed deadline is December 31st for that as well. I really want to finish it by the end of the calendar year. No real reason. I just want to finish it by then. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, uh, that short story. I have a, another novel that's due on May the 31st for a publisher that I, that's the sequel to, um, to the Raven actually that I want to finish the rough draft of by, well, I'm supposed to finish editing by May 31st. That's probably f foolhardy to believe that I'll be able to do that, but I'm hoping I can do that. Hmm. I've written about 40% of the rough draft, and I'm hoping I can finish it and then edit it. We'll see. And yet another project that I'm working on, pretty much all the time now, I'm working on a screenplay. And that's uh, hmm. Ryan, my manager that I mentioned earlier. He's been my... He's like Mr. Miyagi and Yoda rolled into one, man. The guy is just awesome. But he's shepherding me through this process of learning how to write a screenplay. And so we're working on a screenplay together. He, it's the, the ball is currently ping-ponged into his court. He's working on um, – he's editing. He's looking over what I've done. And then he'll show me his edits, of which there will be many because like he'll go line by line, man, and we'll agonize over every adjective, every even every article, man. He'll he'll every single word it will agonize about. Mm -hmm. So that's so I've got those four things going in addition to the family, in addition to the teaching during the pandemic, in addition to the, the business side of writing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's 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 a busy life. It's a good life, but it's a it's an extraordinarily busy life. Mm -hmm. So it's it makes me wonder if COVID has been helpful at all, you know, like reducing some other responsibilities and allowing you to well, write more. Well, when you, when we're on quarantine, when we were on quarantine, that actually did allow me to, because our teaching, even though it wasn't easy to teach virtually, <laughs> um, at that time our, our state allowed us to go three days a week. So, which still meant I was probably teaching five days a week when you factor in the planning and editing. But, um, you know, in a normal teaching school year, I'm teaching seven days a week when you factor in the planning and editing. So I was going from seven days a week to five days a week, which was freeing up a couple days a week to work on my writing. So technically, yes, the, the, the quarantine element during the pandemic when we were quarantined, currently we're, we're, on, we're on site. 
um, you know, which is kind of wild considering how bad everything is getting. Mm -hmm. um, at any time, we could go back to lockdown. But mm -hmm. when we were on lockdown, yeah, I was able to get, that's when I wrote more of Halloween Gods um, back in April and May. I got a lot of it done back then. Mm -hmm. So in that weird way, and again, not to sound whatever dismissive of, of anything, but, but just to be honest, yes, it did help mm -hmm. the writing part a little bit. Well, I don't think it's bad at all to take a bad situation and, and spin a positive um, Agreed. Agreed. out of it. Yeah, that's what I try to do. I agree wholeheartedly, yes. So where can people find you online? Well, I tell you what. I mean, the answer I'm supposed to give is jonathanjans.com. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I don't update that as much as I should. Mm -hmm. So probably the, the most interactive places would be Twitter, mm -hmm. where I'm Jonathan Jans. And then uh, Instagram, I'm Jonathan.Jans. Mm -hmm. And then I'm still on Facebook, but I have like these moral issues here with that. So I'm still there. I'm still there. I feel like it's a necessary evil because a lot of my fans are only on Facebook and I want to stay connected to them. I just, I, I feel like not to, I'm not going to get preachy and th this is a rabbit hole. You probably don't want to go down, but I do feel like it has a negative effect overall in our society. And uh, for that reason, there's part of me that wants to leave it. And, and some people I respect have left it. Um, but currently I'm still there because I want to stay connected to the fans that I have that are still there. Yeah. Others have said the same thing that, yeah, they're, they feel ambiguous about staying on, but, but they have, though they have the same concerns. So that's where, I, yep. That's where I am. And I'll spell your name for listeners. Um, Jonathan J O N A T H A N and Jans is J A N Z. Yep. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any, um, final thoughts or words? No, man, this has been a blast. You've, like I said, you've, you've been wonderful. And, uh, I just appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me. And I, I don't know. I feel like you, I feel like you, you asked some really thought provoking things. Uh, so I, I, I've enjoyed it a lot. It's been really stimulating, really cool. Yeah, me too. Thanks very much, um, for sharing, you know, all the stuff you shared. I appreciate that too on my, uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, Full Contact Nerd, please subscribe and rate it if you can. If you want more fiction and fiction studies ranging from ancient mythology to modern day sci fi, fantasy, and horror, please sign up for my weekly newsletter at fullcontactnerd.com or chrisalvarez.com to keep up with my latest posts. On my webpage, you'll also find written interviews and links to my social media accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I also discuss art, acting, comic books, gaming, and much more. Thanks again, and keep imagining the past, the present, and the future.